We are now going to segue from one set of voices that is often not heard in this room, which was absolutely terrific to hear from folks in uh, media ecology, to a colleague overseas who's going to come to us via uh, extraterrestrial uh, connections, Ellen Nolte, uh, from the London School of Economics and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and she's been doing work for quite some time on comparisons of health and healthcare systems uh, across the EU. And I think we're going to learn a lot about how some of the issues that we're facing in uh, education and with international large scale assessments in education uh, also transfer into the kinds of issues she's been tackling in international large scale assessments in health. So with that, I will turn it over to Ellen, who I hope will have heard okay. what I just said. Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, um, yes, good afternoon, or oh, good morning, everybody. <laughs> uh, can you see and hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much for having me, even if virtually, uh, and giving me the opportunity to share a little bit of the work we are doing around health system and service comparison. What I would like to do during the next 20 minutes is really highlight some of the key motivations for doing comparison, um, which are going to be very similar, I suppose, to what you've been discussing in the morning already, but highlighting in particular the challenges we've been experiencing by doing um, this type of work. And I leave some time for discussion and give you some examples on how the work has been used and possibly even misused in certain contexts um, and the kind of challenges uh, that that brings. Before I start, I just wanted to say a little bit about the organization I'm working for. It's the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies, which is a partnership between 10 governments, the WHO Europe, the World Bank, and the European Commission, and three academic institutions, the School of Hygiene, the School of Economics, and the Technical University of Berlin. And our key aim is really to, um, to inform policy to rigorously analyze uh, evidence to inform and help inform policy development in healthcare and health systems, and that's where uh, the area I'm from um, really represents. So, and I'm going to come back to that uh, perhaps a little bit later. Just to think a little bit about um, comparison and whether they actually are special, and in many ways, all scientific research is comparative really whether we look at um, epidemiological research, experimental research, uh, an element of comparison is always involved in that. However, I think in, when we look at cross-country comparison and whether this is health or education, I think there are particular challenges we are facing and one is the scale of the units we are comparing. We are comparing massive macro social units and they have all their kind of um, challenges in themselves, uh, which is problematic or can be problematic. And of course, if we look at health systems, and I would argue that the same uh, applies to education systems that of course don't act or organize or exist in themselves. They're influenced by the economy, by the culture, cultural envi environment, the political environment. And as such, even if we look at distinct approaches, say financing, delivery, regulation, we have to see that in the broader context of the overall system. And I think that makes it uh, challenging to undertake comparisons, but also to derive conclusions that can be generalizable. When we looked at um, the more theoretical aspect of why we would be bothered taking cross-national uh, comparison, I think there are three main rationales for doing this. And one is, of course, we might just be interested in understanding really what is happening in different systems, which in itself can be quite revealing and, and, and educating, if you like, to help us exploring similarities and differences, but oftentimes also to really help us to then formulate more analytical pieces of work. And the analytical piece of work can be in two ways. One can be really to try to learn why systems and policies are the way they are. Um, you know, help us to generate and test hypotheses, develop typologies, track policy change over time, explain the past. And this often is pretty much for academic purposes. 
policy makers don't tend to be that interested in that, even though we might want them to be more interested in these sort of things. But this is one way of thinking about a, a rationale. But the other one, which I think is way more uh, compelling for policy makers, is really learning lessons from other countries and whether, whether and how we can uh, transfer particular experiences uh, across countries, uh, trying um, to think about this term best practice, which I personally don't really like, but that's what often we are encountering in my work in particular, trying to understand, you know, is there something which other countries have potentially already thought of and we haven't been able to do that in ourselves as yet. So again, this latter background, I think, um, there is a huge opportunity or potential for international learning. And the OECD has coined a phrase, you know, almost looking at some kind of experimental side. So one country can be an experimental laboratory for others. Just Let's just observe what country X is doing and maybe there's some lessons in there for us. But I think it also provides policymakers with alternative options to be considered, which they might not have considered in the past. Mutual learning, cross fertilization, or even transfer of models and ideas, or often also simply to confirm the positive we are doing actually okay, we don't need to change given what country X, Y, and Z is experiencing, or the negative, oh, it didn't work in country X, why should we try to implement it over here? And I think these are uh, different uh, potentials that we can use uh, cross national learning for. And I just want to run you through a couple of ways of thinking about international learning approaches, um, building on what I've just said. And some of the work we are doing, and it's a very pragmatic approach, it doesn't, not necessarily informed by political science, but I think it's a different, useful way of thinking about how comparison can be done. And one is what I've mentioned before, learning about. And this is pretty much descriptive studies, uh, which we do quite a lot of. Um, and it's really trying to systematically capture specific aspects of, in our case, the health system. And we use a very strategic way of doing that, as do other organizations. And I just highlight a couple of examples. For example, the Commonwealth Fund, based in New York, uh, publishes regular profiles of healthcare systems that are very succinct descriptions following a set of key headings around governance, around financing, around equity, just to give you know people who have an interest, immediate interest in the key ways of how systems work. And this allows you to give uh, you, you that type of overview. The OECD produces regular reviews of healthcare quality for readers who are particularly interested in that aspect. and. What we are doing is the so-called health system reviews, which I have just uh, put in here the, uh, the USA, which is a massive book of about 500 pages trying to summarize um, the health systems in the US, which of course there are many. And uh, we produce these reviews on a regular basis for all countries that are members of the WHO European region, plus the US, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, um, and a number of other countries. And this really follows a very systematic structure around the history, around the governance, around uh, regulation governance at a level of decentralization, looking at delivery status, looking at financing aspects, looking at capacity, but also looking at reform. And in the end, we also try to undertake an assessment how well the system actually uh, delivers uh, what it seeks to deliver and what the key challenges are. And this is, we call it descriptive, but at the same time, it's actually also quite analytic because it often highlights issues that haven't really been thought through very well in different uh, settings. And then they, these can then provide us the basis to move on to more analytical studies and try to understand why a particular policy intervention, policy intervention works or doesn't work in a particular setting and how we can understand um, the context that is necessary for this particular policy if we are interested in it to work elsewhere. And these are a couple of studies. We have been involved with, again, I think the one in the middle, the economic crisis, has been a particularly important one in the European context where we've been looking at how the economic crisis of 2008-2009 
2007, 2008, has impacted health and health systems and how different systems have reacted to this and the types of lessons we can learn, but also the types of insights we have gained from that in order to prepare perhaps for a next crisis which may probably will come at some point. And I think this is quite an important aspect for other countries also to look at, okay, how has you know, country X actually reacted to that? What are the kind of policy levers that's put into place? And is there something we can potentially learn uh, from that? A third category of studies, which we, uh, and I think the OECD, and I think, which is perhaps uh, more akin to what you've been discussing today is around quantitative studies. So, um, and in the health system, what we are particularly interested in is trying to understand whether we get essentially value for money, what we put into the system, does it actually deliver the outcome uh, we want to achieve? And, and one way of looking at that is a method we have been working on for quite some time, which is called avoidable mortality, which essentially looks at a trend uh, in mortality from conditions that should not be occurring in a system that provides effective health care. And these are just uh, some of the studies we have been doing here. Um, you can see a graph uh, of this particular indicator for four countries. And I'm going to come back to this particular piece of work uh, in a minute um, when I'm going to discuss some of the challenges uh, these types of exercises uh, involve. And I think there are many. Um, and this is just our website if you are interested in learning more about that. I think there are many challenges. Um, and I think there are pros and cons, really. Um, the issue is if we don't really use our knowledge to provide a detailed understanding why a particular phenomenon is happening in this particular country, we often find a challenge of misinterpretation and misleading conclusions, which can be quite uh, quite uh, uh, substantial if we are not careful. I think there's also this issue, and I don't know the education um, uh, sector that well, but in healthcare certainly, we have a huge amount of data that is often used for comparison, but the problem is the data isn't really collected for comparison. The data is collected for some other purpose. So we do get a lot of measurements, but not really much understanding of the things we really want to understand. And I think there is a challenge here as well. And the third challenge is pretty much around how this evidence is being used. It can be used to a good purpose, but it can also be used in negative purposes, and we end up in, in a debate which is quite ill-informed and doesn't really help us, you know, moving forward. And I think I just wanted to give you some examples um, of, of how um, people have looked at international comparison to really highlight some of the challenges inherent in some of this very broad comparison that might ultimately not be that helpful. And this is for people of you who are interested in international football. They might be interested in this particular graph, which was um, carried out by colleagues here at the King's Fund and York University. So what they did, um, they took examples or the findings from a huge exercise undertaken by the WHO in 2000, which uh, ranked all 192 health systems according to the performance of their health system. So, uh, you know, from Sierra Leone all the way up to uh, high income countries, including the United States uh, and all European countries. And they came up with a ranking. And uh, these two colleagues have been simply co um, correlating this data to countries' FIFA ranking, and they actually did find a correlation. So countries that very good health systems also tended to have very good football teams. Brazil was the odd one out. But I think this particular uh, exercise, I mean, it was a bit of a fun exercise, but actually also quite a serious um, underlying uh, rationale that, uh, that we have to be quite careful in the types of assumptions we put behind some of these comparisons and really challenging, you know, what does this data really tell us about the performance if we can easily move rankings across different types of systems, if you like. This is one way of um, looking at that. 
this is a personal example we've been having with a piece of work we did a couple of years ago where we looked at this indicator I've just mentioned before, avoidable mortality, which we really used to try to understand how well different systems are doing on this particular uh, indicator. And in this particular study, the United States didn't do very well. And as a result, after this was published, uh, we got huge coverage in all sorts of um, uh, newspapers, and this is an extract from the uh, New York Times in 2008, uh, where we had over 180 co uh, comments within a day, I think, on the paper. And what was really interesting, um, for us it was interesting, it, it created a huge debate within the US whether or not we were right or we were wrong. But I thought it was really interesting how it has really incited some fundamental uh, um, discussions within in, in the public. We were branded as prominent European critics, and actually in the whole paper we don't even criticize in any way <laughs> the system. We just present what we find on the basis of this particular indicator. But I mean, this is, I felt for us it was a real interesting example of how easily data can be taken to inform a very different debate, which this particular uh, um, uh, paper wasn't really about. Um, but coming back to the challenges in doing cross-national health system comparison, again, I think many of these points I'm going to make now is very similar to what is going to apply in the, in, the, in the education sector. And one is that of definition and context. For example, in the health system, is a nurse uh, or is the meaning of a nurse equivalent everywhere? And it's not. Does integrated care, which is a particular um, um, concept which uh, many policymakers are concerned about at the moment, does it mean the same in different countries? No, it doesn't. Uh, this doesn't mean that we cannot compare it, but it does mean we have to be quite careful and try to understand what, in fact, are we comparing here. Oftentimes also, and this is what I've mentioned earlier, is the type of data we have available, especially the quantitative data. For example, in healthcare comparisons, we always compare the number of hospital beds, but actually the number of hospital beds doesn't tell you anything about how well a system works. It's essentially it's a mattress with four legs and the numbers of it. So in order to interpret it, we have to actually contextualize what a high or low number really means. So we do need more qualitative information, if you like, in order to make use of this data. Again, for qualitative data, there's also an issue about timeliness. And I don't know about the education sector, but in healthcare, we often have, a, well, no, we usually have a time lag of about two years. So the data we have available now dates back to 2014, if we are lucky, typically 2013 or 2012. And this makes it actually quite difficult to use this data to inform the contemporary debate. And, and I mean, countries are trying to be more timely, but it is a challenge. And finally, I think um, an important aspect is, of course, is cause effect. How do you know, how do we know that a particular policy actually did lead to a particular outcome? One is around time lag between the policy and when we can expect an impact to occur. But I think more importantly, perhaps, is oftentimes policies come into in a whole package. And it's quite difficult to attribute a particular outcome to a particular policy. Uh, which makes it then often quite difficult to see whether uh, you know certain outcomes we observe actually have anything to do with a particular policy that has been introduced uh, somewhere. And this is one set of policies uh, uh, challenges. The other challenge uh, we are also, um, and this is just <laughs> an illustrated example of how to use data actually, uh, just for illustration. This is a very small hospital, which is the one I was born in, in somewhere in Germany. It's a very tiny hospital, but it does go into the international data as does this massive city hospital almost in Stockholm, which is uh, 100 times or 10 times bigger. But often these data are put in a database and just compared uh, to be alike, but of course they are not, and again, this is something which we need to, to understand. In terms of other challenges, I think this is a particular one we've been encountering in a project I've been leading on for the Department of Health here in England. 
is who do you actually compare yourself against? Uh, oftentimes we compare, you know, do we want to compare ourselves with the best? Uh, for what reason? Can we actually achieve that? Do we only want to compare ourselves to countries that are similar, but then, you know, what is similar or the opposite? And then again, what, what does opposite mean? So quite carefully think about who we actually want to learn from or where we want to learn from. But also, I think very important for us always learning for what do we want to really inform policy development or is it to enlarge a policy repertoire to really give us more opportunities to think about something to avoid mistakes made elsewhere or which is quite often also the case to just back up ready-made solutions to just say see they've done that we are right i think all of these have their justification but i think in order to undertake some comparison we need to understand what the purpose is and again, context, which I think is the most important and the oftentimes most overlooked aspect of all. Even if we have a, a particular policy which is on the face of it very similar, the rationale of introducing it is actually very different. And as a result, the outcomes are likely to be different. And, you know, again, we need to be quite aware of these sort of issues. There's also, which we see in healthcare in particular, the potential for improvement actually varies across countries as well. So a particular policy that had a huge impact in country X is unlikely perhaps to have the same impact in a country Y if that country Y starts from a higher baseline. And we have to kind of be aware of, of that as well. And of course, there are all these issues around the institutional setting and the culture, which is influenced by economic factors, by political factors, and by societal values. And I think this is particularly important when we think about simply transferring uh, a policy from one end, from one country to another. So these are some of, some of the many challenges. And I just wanted to conclude really with an example of one of the things we have experienced by doing a, a piece of work for the Ministry of Health here in England a couple of years back, uh, how our evidence has been picked up by policymakers. Unfortunately, not in the way we hoped they would use it. But I'll just uh, run you through very quickly. So in healthcare, there is this very strong, uh, um, and you might, have, um, uh, might be aware of it in the US context as well, to really move care outside hospital into the community for a number of reasons, partly uh, there is this belief that um, outside care, outside hospital is just cheaper and more effective. Now, on this, uh, and this was a piece of work, as I said, was commissioned by the Department of Health here in England, and the aim was really to explore arrangements in a number of countries to really help them inform their policy development. We try to be as representative as you can be with N times uh, eight countries. Of course, it limits a little bit the opportunities you have. But we were looking for countries that are very broad in terms of the way they finance their health care, but also in the way they organize hospital and primary care uh, particularly. So we produced this piece of work. And um, and just show you one extract of our report, which happened to be about polyclinics in Germany. And one particular bit um, I've highlighted here is a sentence taken from our report, essentially saying that these polyclinics were um, introduced in the German health system in 2004 um, as a new model of care, even though it actually wasn't a new model of care, but this is to the side. So this pro uh, uh, product was given to the Department of Health, and they were in parallel working on um, a government policy around community services, and this the document was published uh, a couple of uh, in the same year. And in as part of that work, they produced uh, this particular page, where they said we have looked at lessons that can we can learn from international best practice, and what we found here is exactly the sentence I've just showed you from our report. And we thought, oh, brilliant, they've taken our evidence. They've taken our evidence to inform policy making, which, of course, for us was a really huge achievement because that was the purpose of this work. Unfortunately, the whole 
idea was transplanted almost one to one without taking any consideration of the different context between the two systems. So the polyclinics were implemented in England, but subsequently they were abandoned again because actually the concept didn't quite work in the context because of all sorts of different um, um, contextual factors, the way primary care is organized, the way specialist services are organized, but actually didn't really make this particular approach to providing services viable. Just coming back very quickly to my um, starting question, what is comparison for? In many ways, the work I'm involved with is very much about informing policy. But doing this work, um, we also realize, actually, it also helps us to inform theory. Theory in a way, you know, how policymakers actually use evidence and how we can then use this insight in actually becoming better and in informing policy. But at the same time, you know, a lot of work is being done for academic purposes to inform theory. But we also find, well, actually, this can at the same time then also inform policy. So I think there is kind of ideally a virtuous cycle where evidence is being produced to inform policy, which is then to, uh, used to inform theory and can then in, uh, inform policy again. And in an ideal case, this is what we should be uh, aiming for. So I hope that this kind of gives you a little bit of an insight into some of the challenges we've been facing and we have been trying to overcome and address uh, with our work that's hopefully informing some of the work you've been discussing this morning and we'll be discussing in the afternoon. So what's happening now? Well, uh, good afternoon. Um, your picture has disappeared, but I was going to say it's still nice to see you there on the screen. Uh, I'm Michael <laughs> Foyer. Thank, thank you for this very interesting presentation. I wanted to see if I could uh, press on three issues with three related questions. First of all, can you say a little bit more about um, how the European Observatory gets its funding? Related to that, yeah. can you say something about, from your experience, the, um, shall we say, the appetite for this kind of independent advice on, on the part of European policymakers? Um, I ask that because in the US we have uh, an incredibly dense and complex and expensive advice industry uh, with a lot of money being spent asking for uh, scientifically based policy advice. And I'm curious what your impressions are of uh, the attitudes about that. And I use the word independent because I'm curious to know whether, and this relates to the funding question, whether the European Observatory is considered independent uh, of its uh, respective government partners that are participating in it. And the third question is whether, in your experience, the fact that this is a consortium and a partnership among countries and regions and organizations, does that in itself add to the, to the effectiveness of the kind of influence that you hope to have compared, for example, to within-country organizations that provide uh, just information to their own uh, constituencies. Thanks. Yeah. Lisa, do you, do you want me to uh, um, respond immediately or should I collect questions? I have all day, so no, I, whenever, whenever, <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, so I can just say about the funding. So the funding is, um, it's, so all the governments which are our partners put in um, a certain amount every year uh, in, 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 in this consortium. So it includes the, the 10 governments I've just mentioned, uh, the uh, French National Health Insurance, um, the European Commission, um, the World Bank is notional partner, and then we have WHO. And WHO is our formal host. So all the people who work for the observatory are part uh, WHO staff. Uh, so we are formally part of WHO, but actually our funding comes from our partners. 
um, if that answers your first question. And, and this is interesting because there is no one partner um, that has, you know, the majority impact, if you like, because they pay more or less. Everybody is equal and everybody has their say um, in, in, in our work plan. So we have, um, just to, to, to illustrate how we work, we have um, each, each partner is represented in a steering group and we meet twice a year where we determine with each of our partners the work plan, the type of priorities we want to work on, and, and this is then decided up often in a democratic uh, fashion. In terms of the appetite for independent advice, I think this is crucial. Um, often they ask us to, um, to provide, or I can give you an example. Uh, last year, um, you know, the European Commission on a regular basis assesses all its member states uh, on the financial sustainability following the economic crisis. And so each country is given country-specific recommendations. And one of our partner countries last year was given particular recommendations around health care uh, and long-term care. And that country then asked us, um, in order to help them to move forward um, and to be credible within their country, they wanted us to provide, uh, help them in undertaking a systematic review of their health system and identify opportunities for changing and reforming the health system. And they felt uh, the independence was crucial to do that, uh, our independence to do that. But at the same time, by us working very, very closely with in-country experts, we also were keen to get the country-specific ownership in order to, to bring in the evidence that they could then use to inform um, their reform proposals. But I think independence is certainly um, a, a, key, a key attribute of our work. And we wouldn't, and I think this is something which where we are very different from other organizations. We don't give, we are not prescriptive. We don't give recommendations. What we do do, we say these are the options. You know, if you want to say introduce voluntary health insurance, then you have to think about X, Y, and Z. You know, it might affect equity like that. It might affect you know whatever. So we try to be, not we try, we we are in the, uh, we are neutral as neutral as possible, and that is what our partners really value. In terms of um, how the partnership is such, it is actually quite interesting these, uh, when we have our steering committee meetings because these are all high-level senior people in the department or ministries and they of course feed off each other as well. So just by bringing these people together, they in themselves exchange an awful lot of experience by virtue of being in the same room because they would never really be in the same room in that type of environment. So I think that stimulates an awful lot of interest, an awful lot of ideas, which you then take back to their own countries, uh, and sort of uh, cross-country collaboration in addition as an added benefit, as an add-on, if you like, to the work we are doing. If that kind of answers your question. Yes, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, this is Judy Singer. I'm sorry to say we're out of time, so uh, I want to oh, thank. Yes, thank <laughs> no, that's okay. I want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time to be with us today. This was definitely food for thought. The parallels between the kinds of challenges that you're facing in the health world and what we face in the education world are remarkably similar. I think for several of your slides, if you just yeah. slotted out the word health and put in the word education, uh, it would have been yeah. exactly the same. So th this was definitely. Uh, useful for us, and uh, we thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me, and um, yeah, and good luck for the rest of the workshop. Okay. <laughs> well, with that, let me invite Jack and Michelle to uh, come to the uh, front table, and uh, we'll have our two thirds of our next session. Uh, that brings uh, policy perspective to these issues. We'll then break for lunch and then have Mark Tucker after lunch. So Mark, uh, I want you to prepare uh, a very scintillating conversation for that after lunch lull. Thank you very much. So Jack, why don't you, again, the biographies are in your packet, so I won't waste any time. And Jack, please begin. Great, thank you, Henry. Push, push, the, bu push the button.
Thank you. Well, I'm honored that you want to hear me. Therefore, you told me to press the button. Uh, well, my name is Jack Jennings, and my official title is retired. So I'm not a professor. I'm not a director. I'm just an ordinary person out off the streets. So what I want to talk to you about is uh, these international assessments from my perspective, which is not uh, the perspective of somebody who's a testing expert or some other type of expert, but from their, the effects I think these assessments are having. And this is certainly a growth area, as Peggy pointed out. It's an area that where there's going to be more tests, there's going to be more money spent, uh, there'll probably be more influence. So uh, let me give you my perspective on what the effects of these uh, tests have been in the United States and where I think we can make a small step in terms of using the results better. Uh, first of all, when I started out in the 1960s working for Congress, there were almost no assessments that were international. And given the tendency of the United States to look inward, uh, we didn't pay much attention to other countries. And so these assessments, just by being in existence, are useful to pull us out of our natural tendencies to just look inwards and not look uh, abroad. So that is very good. But the second effect I've seen over time is that uh, the assessments have developed uh, in the press at least a theme, which is that American schools are failing. And this feeds into a common theme. And I, I don't think that's very helpful. I think it's better to say that by certain indices, American schools are not doing as well as uh, other schools in other parts of the world. Uh, so I think that that has not been very useful, but at least we're looking beyond ourselves. The third thing I think that has resulted is that in looking beyond ourselves, uh, there has been support for the development of academic standards. Uh, I think the academic standards movement originated in the United States, but I think people in policy positions looked around the world and they did see that other countries had academic standards, and this was one of the uh, confirming factors that led to adoption of academic standards. But another result, I think, is that uh, it helped to reinforce the movement uh, to look at schools in the United States in terms of success or failure solely in terms of their test scores. Because these tests, uh, international tests, are reported by, uh, in a horse race type of fashion, uh, li uh, listing people from the top to the bottom. And I think too many policymakers and others have uh, decided that that is the only way to rank schools. And so uh, there's been more support for using tests, but using them only as a means, the only means of measuring the success of schools. Uh, and I don't think that's very useful. Uh, the other factor I would point out, the other effect, is that I think uh, international assessments, maybe indirectly, uh, led to No Child Left Behind, as well as uh, uh, the other uh, type of legislation adopted at the state level. But at the national level, I think it's been a, a bad effect because I consider No Child Left Behind a failed policy. Uh, I think it was a mistake by the federal government to adopt that policy. I think it was a mistake by the federal government to attach penalties to test results. And I think we're paying for that right now and we're going to pay for that for a number of years to come in terms of uh, uh, disabling the federal government from being a better partner in education. And it's a mistake we're going to have to live with and work our way apart, away from. But I think the international tests, because in the way that they're presented, didn't cause No Child Left Behind, but I, helped, I think it helped to create an atmosphere in which No Child Left Behind was developed. And uh, I think that was a poor effect. Uh, but I think we can, uh, so to sum up, I think looking at international development, looking at interna international tests over the last number of years, uh, they've had positive and negative effects sometimes more negative, I think, than positive because of the way that they're reported and considered. So let me give you an example of what I think is a positive uh, way to look at these tests. And uh, I think the name of the report is called uh, No Time to Lose by the National Conference of State Legislatures. And what the state legislatures did, and some people in the room, such as Mark, had some uh, effect on them, was that they started with looking at the PISA results and then they debated, this was a bipartisan group of people with the state legislatures. Uh, they uh, went abroad and tried to look at our main competitors to see who did best in these test results, but then they went far beyond the test results. And they started looking at the systems and what the systems were doing in these other countries. And this report is worth reading. Uh, there, this town is awash in reports, but this report is worth reading because 
state legislatures, uh, state legislators are saying that uh, hardly any state system in the United States measures up to what it should be. Uh, they almost uh, say that uh, the systems uh, are not measuring up. They don't say failure, but they come close to saying that. And they say there has to be a, a response state by state, not nationally. They're very careful in not saying nationally because of the atmosphere of the times. But what they propose makes a lot of sense. They propose statewide systems. They look at teacher salaries. They look at teacher training. Uh, they look at uh, uh, preschool education. Uh, one interesting factor is that they propose an expansion of uh, technical and trade education. Uh, but they make an argument that goes uh, far beyond simplistic reports that would call for just more money or that would call for charter schools or one solution. They do propose uh, state systems of education. And uh, Bill, they use NAEP re results from the longitudinal assessment. Uh, they use PISA results, but they go far beyond that and get into real analysis. That, to me, is the way that uh, these international results should be used as an opening step, as a first step to looking at why other countries have better results than we do and what we can do about it to take the best in our own context and develop uh, better systems of education. So I would make uh, one proposal, if I could, uh, to try to move us along in that direction. And that is to propose that uh, there be some type of national report that's re issued every year on an ongoing basis by some independent group, and maybe not by NCES, maybe not by uh, another group, but by an independent, respected group that would look at two things. One, it would look at all the international tests and try to explain to people what they're about, and uh, would then look to see whether there's any way to look at them in a group to see if they tell us anything as a group about American education. But try to explain to people what they, their strengths and their weaknesses, and uh, try to make some sense out of it. I guess we're going to have a situation in the next couple of months where there's going to be uh, three different types of tests that are coming out talking about science achievement Amer of American kids. Uh, NAEP, uh, PISA, and uh, TIMS. And what if they go in different directions? Is the press going to report one day American kids succeed, another day American kids fail, another day God knows what American kids do? I mean, what's a press person supposed to do where there's fewer and fewer press people, and yet they are faced with three press releases from the federal government and international organizations talking about science literacy of American kids? Uh, especially if they have varying results. So I think there should be uh, some annual report that is ongoing, that looks at each test, explains what it means in the total context, and then looks at them all, and then looks over time at all these test results so that somebody gets an idea over time what they might mean. And I think this report should be written by Naomi because <laughs> <laughs> she has a way of being an expert but being understood. <laughs> And it would be good to have something that press people could understand. But the second part of this report, and this is, uh, let me tell you my, my presumption, and you may agree or may not agree, how reports are presented, how data is presented, often suggests a solution to the problem they've identified. And so if the problem is, uh, can American schools do better? And uh, the discussion internationally is only in terms of test results then you're going to suggest that people concentrate only on raising test results. And that leads to something like NCLB, which is a policy that is focused on only raising test results. So th these results have to be presented in a broader fashion beyond just the test results. And I think the second part of this report should explain what the factors are in society, what the factors are in schools that have effects on kids. And uh, if it's true, that's some large percentage of uh, the correlation of uh, an effect on student performance is from outside school, 70% or whatever. Uh, you can't just look at a test score. You have to look at the context of the society in which the uh, test is being administered. If it's true that within a school, the main factor is the quality of the teacher, you have to report on the quality of teaching within each of these countries in their schools. Uh, you have to report that Finland has very high qualities for accepting teachers, 
we have very low uh, standards for accepting teachers. And even when we have standards for accepting teachers, we waive them when we can't get enough teachers and bring in other people that uh, will just teach. So these results should be presented uh, in conjunction with uh, social factors, with uh, factors within the schools that try to explain in some way why other countries have higher scores than we do and what we should be thinking about. The, uh, one, I have two faults with the no time to waste report. Uh, one is that they used uh, longitudinal NAEP data without disaggregating, and therefore they showed very little progress. If they had disaggregated, they would have showed very great progress. But that was, uh, so that's my one quibble. Uh, the other quibble is that the state legislature, legislators did not deal with the factors outside school. They only dealt with the factors inside school. Now, I understand politicians and all that, and this was a bipartisan group, so they probably couldn't get into minimum wage and social inequalities and such. But uh, their report is very good on the school part. It's not very good on the uh, out-of-school part. So, so that's my uh, basic message. Uh, these international assessments are going to grow in number. They're going to grow in terms of the space they occupy in the public debate. Uh, I hope be, as that happens that we make better use of them by having some guide to people about what they mean in terms of assessments and uh, secondly what they mean in terms of uh, being produced in societies according to certain social factors and being produced in schools according to certain uh, factors within those schools. So that is what I recommend. Uh, people wanted suggestions for improvements. That's one I lay on the table. Thank you. Well, thank you also for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm president of Knowledge Alliance, which you, if you're not familiar with us, we are an advocacy organization. We focus on the federal investment in education research, evaluation, technical assistance, and innovation. Um, prior to taking on this role, though, I worked for the Senate uh, Education Committee, which is called HELP. And um, so I'm mostly today, you know, I was trying to think I'm not a researcher, I'm certainly not an assessment expert, but I thought, well, what can I bring to the discussion? And so I'm going to focus on uh, the policy piece in terms of how, how do you get people's attention as, for policymakers and how do you get your message across? Uh, I was very excited to see that um, the morning session. I think um, you know, we need the research community in general needs to focus more on communications. Um, and I know IES, which is the agency that I spend the most time covering, um, has made some significant efforts in those areas in social media and use of infographics and stuff like that. And I know um, last year I presented at a, a PI, is it principal investigator? I don't know what PI stands for, but um, meeting and they had a whole session on communications. And I, you know, I really think this is critical. Uh, we just can't assume that people who are trained as researchers have learned anything about how to communicate stuff. <laughs> Um, I say that I love researchers, but I you know, want to be honest. I, I have a friend, a um, good friend of mine who's at Center for American Progress, and she asked me to read a paper recently and give her comments. And when I asked her, well, what do you think of my comments? She said, they're very direct. So I'm going to be very direct. <laughs> um, so just to give you a perspective, I mean, I think people, when they're trying to influence, and I'm going to stick to mostly members of Congress, you could probably take um, some of this and apply to agencies that you're trying to influence as well, but I'm just going to stick to the legislative body for this discussion. Um, you know, I think people um, sometimes from the outside get very, like, obsessed with meeting with the actual member of Congress. Like, we have to have a meeting with the senator. We have to have a meeting with, you know, the congresswoman. And the reality is, um, I know this is being recorded, oh well. You know, staff do like 90% of the work, so like, you know, put that aside. Like, yes, if you can get a meeting with the, the chair of the committee, wonderful, but, um, you know, <laughs> Jack thinks it's higher. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, the, what's on their plate on any given day is so enormous, particularly, I, I would say, for senators, it's even greater. I, I mean, I distinctly remember um, you know, briefing Senator Harkin about something about, you know, how we're changing away from adequate yearly progress to, you know, the next thing when in our bill when we were working on ESEA. 
And, you know, he was very into it, and we were talking, very intense, and then, you know, the, the buzzer goes off to let them know it's time to vote. There's a vote on the floor. And, you know, he's been in Congress for a really long time, so, of course, he ignores it for, like, <laughs> the first 15 minutes. And then, eventually, you know, his scheduler opens the door, and the legislative director steps in, which is, like, you really do have to go now. And he's like, it's the vote on whether we should have a no-fly zone over Syria, right? So he's going from this really intense conversation about education policy to like whether we should have a you know a no-fly zone over Syria. So like this is what's on a, the plate of a of a U.S. senator every day. So um, I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, so staff really are key. Um, I think, too, you know, committee staff have a lot more time, so people who actually work for the chairman or the ranking member, like, they really have the most time to focus on this stuff. And I would argue probably in the Senate they have more time in the House. My experience is that um, in the House, and Jack could probably say more about this, but it seems like they have to also staff the full committee, not just the chair and ranking, whereas in the Senate we didn't have to do that. Um, so they're going to be the folks who really have the most time and knowledge and ability to process everything that you're saying. And once you get down to even like people who are staffing a member on the committee, like say Senator Bennett um, for Colorado, former district superintendent, huge interest in educational issues. I mean, his education staffer is probably co covering three issues. So she's covering education, but she's also covering criminal justice or health, nutrition, you know, who knows? So it's it's important to keep in mind that I think sometimes people get frustrated when they meet with staff and feel like, well, they're, I don't feel, you know, the rise of the BlackBerry, right? Like everyone's on their BlackBerry and are they really listening and paying attention? But I just want to give you a sense of like what their day is like. I mean, it's basically all meetings all day and you're covering a whole bunch of issues. So those are the people that you probably want to target the most. And then, you know, once you get to personal office, so, so people who are not on committees, like their ability to really, um, the, you know, especially on the House side, you're probably covering five issues. Um, and it really comes down to, particularly I think on the House side, is like, well, what is it exactly you want me to do? And I think the challenge with the international assessments is that you're coming in, like a big release comes out, and you're coming in, and you're very excited you know, about what you're going to present on, and like, there's nothing that you're actually telling them to do with this information. You're just informing them. Well, people are very busy, and so like, it's nice to be informed, but it's like, thank you, and then you leave, right? And I don't really know what you want me to do with this data. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, I noticed Jack had, has really big font, and that's so smart. I'm still in denial about my ability to read my own handwriting. That's very small. <laughs> um, uh, so I think you know that's just to give you a sense of like who it is um, you're talking with. And you know, I mean, it's not that. I think sometimes people think staff like don't understand or aren't smart or anything like that. And it's not really that. It's just you really the barrage of information you're getting on a daily basis is is, is vast. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Although I would say, I agree with Kevin, I think some people are not good at math, and so when you are showing them a chart, like, take your time, because, you know, if you say to someone, you know, the x axis is this, and the y axis is this, and this, me does that make sense? You know, people are going to say yes, and it probably doesn't, you know, because you went really fast, but they don't want to admit they don't know. So, like, take your time with graphs. Um, so... I, so there's a couple other things. Of course, while everyone else is talking, I made side notes to myself. Um, I would say, you know, if you go in to talk to a legislative staffer, you know, expect you have a half an hour. The number of people who come in who think they get an hour is like, they just assume they get an hour. And it's like, no, you get a half an hour. And then by the time, and please don't take really long time to tell me, like, all your credentials. Like, really? Like, you just, that's 10 minutes. So now we have 20 minutes, right? So. Um, just really assume that you have a very short period of time to get your point across. Um, before I have a couple of slides, and before I get into those, I just would like to make a little sidebar about um, Democrats versus Republicans. And broad brush, huge generalizations, but I'll just want to lay them out there. You know, we, I'm a Democrat personally. Um, you know, Knowledge Alliance is nonpartisan. We work both sides of the aisle. But my experience is that most people that work in education are Democrats. Um, and they often tend to think, like, data's great. We love data. More data, more data, more data. Um, more, more, more on education. More money, everything, right? 
Well, I mean, that's not necessarily the Republican perspective. And um, I think there is some skepticism amongst Republican offices about particularly OECD and OEC data. Um, I don't want to upset anyone, but I'm just laying it out there. I recently just asked, you know, Rick Hess is a friend of mine, works at AI, and I was like, so, you know, he's been snippy about PISA in the past. I'm like, so, you know, what's the deal with this? And he's like, well, they're just very nanny state about everything, the OECD. So, again, you know, you, nanny state, nan nanny-ish, like telling, every, we know what's best and you should all do this because we've sort of figured this out. I just say that because, you know, right now we have two houses that are controlled by Republicans and you know, maybe we'll flip the Senate, you know, in next two months from now. Um, but even if we flip, it's gonna be close, right? It's gonna be back to what it was before and it's just like you need 60 votes and like, the point of the matter is you can't just convince Democrats of what you want. Like the idea that you can just ignore the whole other party because they're like, you think they're irrational or you don't understand their point of view or you don't like talking to them. <laughs> um, that doesn't work. Um, you have to take their perspective into account even if you disagree with it. And there is more skepticism on their side about international data. I, one example I'll give is that um, we've had many FERPA debates in Congress, and when ESEA was moving, there was this terrible FERPA bill that Senator Vitter from Louisiana was saying he was going to add as an amendment or pr propose as an amendment on the floor. And so we had this huge effort. We worked with the ARA to like try to kill this this amendment. And um, I was just looking for things to try to like explain to staffers that there are protections put in place for privacy, because the, the issue right now is privacy, right? Like privacy is a huge issue. And there are regs, you probably know better than I, that uh, dictate what um, quality data is and like protections around that. I can't remember the name of the regulations themselves that are put out by the federal government. And I share them with someone who I think is actually a very reasonable um, Republican staffer on the House side, and I was like, you know, does this help? And the first thing she said to me, and I think she actually read it because she mentioned this, she's like, well, why does it talk about the UN? And I was like, hmm, I don't even remember the regs somewhere in there mentioning the UN. And sure enough, there was a mention of the like, UN and data standards, and that's a red flag for a lot of conservative offices. Again, you may not like this, you may think this is crazy, but this is the environment that we are working in, and so we have to figure out um, how to talk to people that don't think exactly the way we do about things. And, and by the way, for those of you who might be following the, the re uh, reauthorization of the Education Sciences Reform Act, which is the law that reauthorizes uh, Ezra, is Ezra is the law that reauthorizes IES, the main reason we haven't gotten it past the finish line is because of privacy issues. Like people, um, there's some parent groups out there that, um, you know, some of what they put out is misinformation. Some of some of it is raising legitimate concerns, but they um, they've essentially kept the bill from getting done. So you can say, oh, I don't really care what these sort of fringe people think, but they're actually keeping laws from getting passed. So it matters. Um, so to my slides. So I think that um, can I do it? Oh, there it is behind me. Um, so I don't have to explain this slide. This is very exciting. But <laughs> pretend if you had to explain it, like you do want to take time. But you could even, you know, if you were really pressed for time, you just say where you want the quadrant you want to be in, like the good quadrant, right? Like if you're explaining this slide to, slide to a staffer. And the reason um, I chose this, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, too, it's older data. I, um, but this is the one report I could find this slide in, is that if I'm a federal policymaker, um, on, and I care about education, and maybe I'm on the committee, hopefully I'm on the committee, um, I would think the federal role is mostly about how do, we, how do we make sure we improve things for disadvantaged students, right? I mean, that's like what motivates someone like a Michael Bennett, right? Like this is why he became a senator. So I wanna know that it's possible where you have poverty, kids in poverty can stu still do well. Is that, that's a possibility. And that in some countries, um, people are, they're doing better. This is sort of the William Schmidt argument. Some countries are doing better with kids who are high poverty 
than the United States is. And so this is a slide that I think would help illustrate that argument. I see there's lots of caveats because of the triangles or whatever, the diamonds, but nevertheless, um, I think it makes a case and it's something that would be compelling to a member of Congress because that's something that they have control over. So if you were, um, if you're in the middle of the ESCA debate, like this would make a great slide for a floor speech, right? If you're trying to, I don't know, talk about why you should change the Title I funding formula or whatever it is within ESCA, like, this to me is a very understandable slide. Um, so that's why I chose this one. Can you go to the next slide? The other thing I would say that gets people's attention is anything related to jobs, right? The economy, like people care about, are people in my, my state, my district, are they gonna have jobs? Like what's the future of the economy? And I do think there's been um, attention by groups, I've seen mostly from like a McKinsey and Society, but I'm sure other groups have done it too, but the rate of youth unemployment, especially in certain countries, as you can see from the slide, I like how this is right in front of me, that's awesome, um, is you know extremely high, and this is worrisome, right? Now, I don't know, I, you know, I know a little bit about PISA and TIMS. I don't know the PIAC data that well. But if I were someone who was trying to make a case for why you know, th this data collection matters and how it can help with policy, I would probably take a slide like this and then, can you go to the next slide? And then take a slide like this from PIAC where you see, um, you know, we have some issues here, like people can't get jobs sometimes because they don't have the skills that they need to have those jobs. I mean, there's also the issue of jobs disappearing, which is a separate issue, um, you know, interrelated, obviously. But, you know, I picked, and I would pick the math one because it's more dramatic than the reading one, right? So if you have a chance to sit down with somebody and actually talk through this slide, and, um, you know, I like, you can see there's a theme here. I like the one before with the country names. I think it's just easier for people to understand. Sometimes the ones I think that are about quartiles, you, you lose people. Um, but anyways, this is a slide that I would connect to that. Like, we need to know, we need this data to know what's going on and how we can make policies to change. And then, you know, depending on, you know, Congress is all about, well, what's moving at that particular time. So if ESCA is moving, you know, you find an ESCA tie-in. If the Workforce Investment Act, which passed a couple years back, is moving, you somehow figure out a way to tie it into WIA. Um, you know, that's really, people, people in Congress want to know, like, can I do something about this? Not just inform me. And I'm not saying you have to tell them, you're probably not in a position to tell them exactly what to do or how to write the legislative language. You know, that's what groups like my group, my organization does, but you can find, policy partners to do that if you're interested. And then the last slide I would say that, ooh, that was my fault, um, that I think, every time I see this slide, I'm like, oh, um, that I think gets people's attention is, you know, what the trends with automation and artificial intelligence, uh, you know, for people who are making, you know, below $20 an hour, I mean, wow, like, are you going to have a job in a few years? No, you're not. Um, and I think I've just started seeing this kind of permeate the conversation, but I think um, I find this slide pretty startling. And actually, a, a member of the um, House Appropriations Committee used this slide at, at the markup. Um, I think if the labor age bill might have been full committee, I can't remember, but um, I was impressed. And, and, and <laughs> you know, what is this slide? The robots are coming, right? Like, it's, it's a pretty, pretty good slide because you can also talk about robots. Um, but this also gets someone's attention. And I'm sure there's some way to tie this back to PIAC. I don't know PIAC well enough to, you know, say what that is. But, um, you know, I think you, there's like two things you want to be doing in these kind of meetings is A, making the point that, and this is why we have NCES, and this is why we fund NCES, so this data gets collected, and we know. Like, this is why we participate in international surveys, so that we know this. And if we don't fund it, if we don't support it, we just won't even know, to Jack's point, for you know, 20, 25 years ago. And then the second point is we can use this data to help shape policy in ways that are meaningful. Um, so I think I might be over time, so I think um, I will stop there. But, um, oh, the one last thing I wanted to say, too, just related to PISA, is I do think, too, um, 
there are groups like, I don't know if people know America Achieves. This is a group that John Schnur started a few years back. And they um, worked with OECD on the OECD, OECD test for schools. I don't know if people have heard of this, but you can basically take like OECD like piece of items and um, run them at your at the school level. And I think it's it's something to keep your eye on. Now the Northwest Evaluation Association and WA is is administering it. But I think um, I think there is an appetite. Um, it, you know, it does tend to be more like suburban <clears throat> schools, but I think there is an appetite for people at the school level, understanding how they compare internationally. And so I think that's just something to keep an eye on. Thank you very much. We actually have uh, time for one question, and then we're going to have a, a, a full question period after, uh, after Mark. So one question? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, just, just your question. Hank, could you identify yourself? Uh, Hank Levin, um, you, you, I, I liked very much your presentation. I understand it very well. But what was interesting is you showed a chart with differences in PIAC scores, clusters, and then you said uh, sig significant differences among those bands. And it should be our responsibility not to talk about the conventional term significant because they think that's rah, rah, wow, that's big. It isn't big or usually isn't big. And if we use words like uh, this particular cluster, uh, any differences could be due to chance. That's what we should use. We shouldn't use words like, st like significant because the normal interpretation of that parlance is something very, very different than our work would show. So we have to work on that ourselves. Uh, and it's interesting that you use something which they will interpret differently than we, all of us. Well, interpret. right, and also, like, I'm an advocate, so I, my tendency, I want to motivate you to do something. <laughs> That's just how I tend to operate. Not to say that I would do something that was factually inaccurate. Like, I, I hear what you're saying. Like, I don't want to overstate things, but again, like if I'm bothering to take a staffer's time, like I have something that I think is important and then they should do something about it. It's not just to inform you. So like if there really is no difference and it doesn't matter, then like don't make an appointment to see me. It, it, it's not only that, but the other part of the conversation, we really don't know what the consequence of those differences are. So even having the word up there Magnitudes are important, relating those magnitudes to something that they think. One example is that they think that that has big effects on the economy. Uh, the data don't really show that. Uh, so we, we need to be clear on why those differences are important, not just in general terms and not just in vague <coughs> terms like our, our, our labor force, but some things that are more concrete that come out of the evidence. What, what is not important? What, what's not, doesn't have affect the labor market? I wasn't sure what. Whatever criteria, in other words, why do we think that these differences in scores are important? Because presumably they have an impact on adult success or, right. or something. Okay, happiness, I don't know. And we should really get at those things in terms of just letting them, again, they misunderstand. They just see number differences, statistical differences, even when they are statistically significant. And they have a map in their head of what that means. The average person thinks that test scores really have a big effect on earnings. They have an effect on, apparent effect on earnings. It's very modest. I, I mean, I guess I thought cognitive ability was, was uh, affects labor participation. I mean, you guys know so much more than like the, I mean, you have to sort of really take it back a step. I mean, you know so much more about this stuff than the average person, and I just think, I've just seen it enough times. People throw in so many caveats and so many, but this mean you just end up not wanting to, like, I don't know what you want me to do. Like, as a staffer, I'm just like, all right, well, I'll, or I guess I'll do nothing, you know? I mean, I just 
really be careful. You, so you have like almost too much knowledge. <laughs> Can I state that in a different way? Um, Say it in a better way, please. <laughs> Uh, the policy world and the research world are different. In the research world, I think you're so used to uh, use of statistics and the use of numbers that you don't realize that in the policy world, people don't understand that. They don't understand charts. They don't understand uh, the way data is presented. And so if you come into a senator's office or a congressman's office, congresswoman, and present something, you may not be talking to them because they may not understand what to you is a clear chart, but to them is a mystery. Maybe it has to do with the condition of American education, but, uh, <laughs> but don't presume that people you are talking to understand a regular chart. Uh, that's pretty harsh, but um, I can tell you it's true. Yeah, now, and the, the charts they use, uh, sometimes they'll spend a lot of time making sure it's presented the right way, like there's a famous chart that's been used for 20, 30 years by conservatives showing the increase in uh, spending in the United States and the not, no increase in achievement. And they pick the right data to present that. You could present that a different way and have a different result, but they pick that and they use that as a policy argument, and it's been consistently used uh, for 20, 30 years. So uh, just don't presume that people know what you know. And that's the challenge to you. If you go into a congressional office or go into a, uh, even a press uh, office, uh, presume they don't understand a chart that you understand simply and try to convert or converse with them without thinking of a chart. Tell them what it means without having them to try to figure out what it means in terms of graphs and everything. We had this policy, uh, this problem at CEP you know, uh, the knowledgeable people I had who wrote all these things would present it to me and I couldn't al always understand it because I'm not from a research world. And so now I understand a little bit more. <laughs> but uh, I would not presume knowledge. Well, with that, 